Uh, my wife Vicky and I had, uh, had an interesting weekend. Uh, by the way, some of you are wondering, like, why do I have a boot on and the, the, the scooter? I had uh, broken my foot a couple of weekends ago on a Friday, so uh, on the road to recovery, and uh, my goal is whatever it takes on Easter Sunday morning, I'll jam this foot into a shoe if I have to wear a clown shoe. I'll do that and be without the cart and be without, or the scooter and be without the boot. So, but uh, Vicki and I on Friday night went to New Buffalo, Michigan. Along with a few thousand of our friends, we were in a uh, concert venue to see an old 70s Chicago rock group. Had a lot of fun. It was loud. It was fun. And, and uh, this is uh, a group that uh, actually uh, University of Illinois and um, got their start there and we enjoyed them back in the 70s and 80s and uh, enjoyed them Friday night too. But there was this moment at the concert, kind of a break, where the lead singer is 71 years old, we know because he told us that, he said, you know, the uh, world seems to be getting crazier and crazier. He thought back in the 70s it was wild. He said, it feels like it's crazier now. And he said, I thought by this age I would have life figured out. <laughs> but he doesn't. And here's what he said. Um, I thought by now I'd have life figured out, but I simply try and take one step at a time and live day by day. Oh, the crowd just roared. And I thought, it's like the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I mean, literally at 71, you think the way to face the future is to live a day at a time? And then the contrast of that was, we drove back, it was late Friday night into early uh, Saturday morning, and, and then Saturday we had a funeral over at uh, our Kell Stream campus, and uh, Ryan actually uh, led the worship, did a terrific job. Daniel Kim, our pastoral resident, preached, uh, resident, preached a terrific message, and Pastor Tate sort of led the service, and it was for a man who had some challenges in life. When they uh, read the story of his life, it was really amazing some of the things he had gone through. And person after person got up. We'd opened up the, the room for the microphone for people to come up and talk about their uh, memories or their, their things that they would remember about this man. Over and over again, the people said this. Um, God was with him. And now he's with God enjoying the glories of heaven. The contrast could not have been greater from thousands of people in a concert venue hearing, well, just, I don't know, live day by day, yay, to about 125, 150 people gathered. Talk about a man who's had some real challenges and hardships in life and died, what we would say is too early, and yet the settled hope the care of God during his life and the welcome he has in heaven the day of the moment that he died. What, what do we do about the future? How, how do we prepare for that? We spend a lot of time thinking about it. In fact, the two questions we want to ask is, is well, what's going to happen and how do I prepare for it? By the way, as I said a few weeks ago when I was preaching, like you look at the last five years, I had no idea. And uh, that, that, in fact, is the point of Mark 13. If you have your copy of the scriptures, take a look there. Mark chapter 13. We're in this series in the book of Mark dealing with those things that really matter in life. The true value of things. Pastor Austin last Sunday preached just a terrific message where he talked about the true value of possessions and how often we stay so focused on those things or resources that can draw our attention away from the things that matter which is a walk with God and those sorts of things. And then today we're going to talk about the future. Jesus addressed both the questions I just raised. What's going to happen? And what do I do to prepare for that? Now, when you begin talking about the future in the Bible terms, you talk about prophecy. People have all kinds of attitudes toward that. For some, the attitude is, I don't know, I don't care. For others, it's like they're obsessed with it. Well, there needs to be a balance there because we do need to care about the future. We're going to spend the rest of our lives there. But we shouldn't let the future take us away from our day-to-day -day faithfulness to Jesus Christ. Uh, I grew up in the uh, 70s. And if you would have grown up in the 70s, you would have recognized like prophecy conferences were a big thing. Uh, Ken, I want to skip ahead. We're going to show those uh, pictures of the prophecy conferences. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember this, but, but like it was all over. It was on the radio. Thousands would gather for these conferences, and it could be pretty complex. Take a look at it. Here's uh, from years ago. It's only 100 years old. Uh, here's like, that's the future. Wow, that's a mess. Uh, like it gets worse. Like, look at the next one. Uh, simple enough for you? 
And, and there, there are some who just like, that's all they think about, all they write about. You read books on it. You, you look at the podcasts about it. You, you're on the internet about it. And it's just, it's not healthy to be that consumed with the future. But we also need to recognize our world is going somewhere. There's a destination God has already prescribed, and we ought to know about that and be prepared. Let me, from Mark 13, give you sort of some Bible principles for how we can be prepared for the future. And let me start by saying this, and this is sort of the theme of Mark chapter 13, where Jesus addresses the two questions. What's going to happen and how can I be prepared for what happens? Here it is. Jesus calls his followers. Listen. Jesus calls his followers to be the most discerning and most hopeful people on earth. You and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, should be the most discerning. There should be a, a wisdom and a stability that saves us from being torn with this kind of a headline or that kind of a headline. And, and not only that, not only should we be discerning people, we should also be hopeful. Uh, we should not find ourselves at 71 years of age saying, well, I just don't know anything about life, but I try and live a day at a time. As we get older and more mature in our faith, more than ever, our confidence in the power of our good God to accomplish his will in this life should give us hopefulness and encouragement. Mark chapter 13 grows out of a question that Jesus' followers asked him. In fact, look at Mark chapter 13. When we get to Mark 13, we're just a week or so out from Jesus' crucifixion, his resurrection. The disciples are still cherishing the hope that Jesus, who had been welcomed into Jerusalem a few days prior to this, as a saving, conquering hero, the promised king God would send. Even the crowd chanted, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail the king of Israel. And Jesus spent some time at the temple teaching. Look at Mark chapter 13. As Jesus came out of the temple, verse 1. One of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. Uh, they were in Jerusalem. Jesus had ridden in a hero. Now he's teaching in the temple where he should have been. And his disciples pointed out, look at this place. It's magnificent. And by the way, it was. The ancient temple in Jesus' time, Jerusalem temple, considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It towered above everything else. One of the parapets, 15, uh, 15 stories high, one of the walls, and it was decked out in gold and purple, built with giant stones. One scholar said that the, the temple mount was 35 acres. It could accommodate, uh, accommodate 12 football fields. Some of the stones in that measured 42 feet long, 11 feet high, 14 feet deep, and weighed over a million pounds. And so the archaeologists have said that the magnitude of the Temple Mount and the Jewish Temple Stones exceed in size any other temple in the ancient world. It was the identity of that nation. Israel's hope there on the Temple this was the place God was sure to come and rescue them. And here was Jesus in the temple teaching. And on their way out, the disciples were like, wow, look at this place. Now look at Jesus' response to that. Verse 2, Jesus said to them, do you see these great buildings? I'm sure they're like, yeah, we just pointed it out to you. <laughs> there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. That's a buzzkill. <laughs> to get the sense of that for us as modern Americans, think of someone visiting Washington, D.C., the Capitol, and saying, look at the Capitol building, glistening in the sunrise, the marble dome towering over the city on Capitol Hill. And someone saying, you know, the day's going to come when that will be reduced so much you won't even know it was ever there that all that we hold is secure and steady, represents our hopes of the future, can be taken from us. 
What do you do when you don't know what the future holds? What do you do when there's a sense of everything you held dear and secure now taken away and you face the future uncertainty with uncertainty? There will not be left one stone here, Jesus said, that's not thrown down. Verse 4, as you might expect, the disciples had some questions. Tell us, when will these things be? What's going to happen? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? How do we be prepared for that? What follows is Jesus' longest recorded speech in the book of Mark that he gives to his disciples. And in that, he talks about two things. And again, Jesus, brilliant teacher that he is, weaves together the immediate question of what's going to happen to this thing that we know and love, the temple, our identity, our security, our national place of gathering for worship. What's going to happen and when's it going to happen? But later on in this talk, he expands it away from sort of the immediate, there's going to be a destruction of Jerusalem and a demolishing of the temple, to saying that's only a foreshadowing of one day when the world itself will be renovated, and Jesus Christ promised that he would return in glory. Both are going to be covered in this text. So let's read through it. In, in Mark 13, there are 19 imperatives. That is, 19, do this. It tells me that in the face of uncertainty about the future, I'm not supposed to be passive. I'm supposed to be active, again, leading the way with discernment and hope. Let's read through. Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. See why the focus is on discernment? For many will come in my name saying, I am he, and will lead many astray. There'll be those who are false Christ. Oh, I'm the one God sent. Trust me. Not only that, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. See that no one leads you astray, and don't panic. This must take place. Now look at the, now I've got this next phrase underlined. But the end is not yet. Just because there's false teachers, just because there's political and military turmoil, does not mean the end is here. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famine. Look at the end of verse 8. These are but the beginnings of birth pangs or birth pains. What Jesus is saying is that we live in a fallen world, and that fallen world is going to continue on its course. There will be political turmoil. There will be war and rumors of more war. Any of you guys read the Tribune? <laughs> the Daily Herald? The New York Times? Wall Street Journal? The last year, it's all about war and rumors of war. What happens if the war spills over? You know what that is? That's what it's like to live in a fallen world where political leaders, especially weak or insecure ones, think their best path forward, uh, best path forward is to do more, more, and gather more and more power. These, Jesus said, this is just the beginning. Th th this stuff's going to happen. But now look at verse 9. It goes from living in a fallen world in sort of the general sense of natural disasters and political turmoil and military turmoil and becomes much more personal. Yeah, well, what happens when it impacts me personally or my family? Be on your guard. There's another one of those commands, an imperative. They will deliver you over to councils and you will be beaten in synagogues and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. Jesus tells his followers, before that temple is destroyed, they're going to come after you. By the way, every single one of those promises, those prophecies comes true in the book of Acts. Every single one. Just as Jesus said his first followers would face persecution, pressure and pushback, they did. Look at verse 10. I love it. I have it underlined. So often we think maybe when cultural pushback happens or turmoil or even personal trouble in our families, the thing to do is just shut up and don't say anything else about my faith. That's actually the opposite of what Jesus calls us to do. This good news, this gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations, literally to every ethnicity. Meaning in a face of turmoil and culture, in the face of military, in the face of political and economic uncertainty, 
even at times when you face personal pushback for your faith, it's time to open up and live out our faith with hope. Because what's gonna happen is there's going to be an inevitable advance of the gospel into the darkness of the world around us. Verse 11, so what do I do? When people are against me, when there's conflict in my own personal life, what should I do? Verse 11, when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, say that with me, what is it? Do not love that. Do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say. Say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak the Holy Spirit. Some of you have gone through difficulties. You've had conflict at work. You've had conflict in your family, and you've had conversation. Maybe it didn't end well. It ended poorly, and you're thinking back. You're like, oh, man, I wish I would have said that. Stop. Jesus said, don't overthink it. What you said in that moment is precisely what that person needed to hear. The Spirit of God, when we walk with, the, with, with Jesus, when we walk in the Spirit, the Spirit of God will give us what to say. Listen to me. Stop worrying, and all God's people said, and stop overthinking. It's not my job to convert people. It's my job to say the word of the gospel and let the Spirit of God do his work. Believers, if you think you have to have a polished speech before you can share your faith, you are not thinking biblically. Our Savior said, do not overthink it. Do not feel under the pressure to have three points in a poem. You just say what God puts on your heart. Man, the Spirit of God uses that in that moment. Now, he gets even more personal. He talks not just about work or school or cultural pressures. But what about our families? Brother will deliver brother over to death. Father is child. Children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated for all, uh, by all, for my name's sake. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot. And every single promise that he made to those first followers came true in the book of Acts, in the first generation. So what do you do? Look at the last phrase. The one who endures to the end will be saved. We are to be discerning. We are to be hopeful. Whatever else happens around us, as unsure as and uncertain as it is, going backwards is the wrong decision. Backing off of our faith commitments is the wrong decision. What God calls us to do is endure, persevere, and in doing so, we'll be saved. Those who press you, those who give you belittling or make fun of you do not have better answers for life than you do. In fact, so often it's those who are the most insecure or uncertain that speak the loudest. And what we're called to do is with perseverance, discernment, and hope, live out our gospel. Now, verse 14, Jesus gets very specific for that first generation of believers who ask the question, when's the temple going to come down? And so he now goes to the temple again. So, so in general, he says, hey, before this thing happens, there's going to be pressure on you and turmoil in the world. And now he goes to a specific answer. Look at verse 14. When you see, and it's very emphatic, you, disciple who asked me about the temple, when you see, and wow, what does this, these words mean? The abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be. And then Mark, the author, says, let the reader understand. So, so Jesus there by the temple points and says, when you see something so terrible that the temple is deserted, an abomination is something that shouldn't be. There, there's something that shouldn't be that causes desolation or empty. There's an emptying out of the temple. When you see the temple being emptied out, because something remarkable has happened, look at what he says. You need to flee. Get away. This exact thing happened 40 years after Jesus promised this. Roman general... Vespasian conquered Jerusalem. 
overran the temple, burned it to the ground, and ordered his soldiers to take it apart stone by stone. So that today, you go to Jerusalem, you're not going to see anything that remains of that temple. Maybe the foundation. And even then, there's debate about where it was. So thorough was the destruction. And Jesus warned his followers, when you see that happening, when you see that temple being deserted, don't stay and fight. Get out of Dodge. Flee. In fact, look at what he says. The immediacy. Verse 15. If you're on the housetop, do not go down. Do not enter the house. Don't take anything out. Let the one who's in the field, don't turn back and take his cloak. And alas, for women who were pregnant in those, nursing in those days. It's going to be really hard if you have a young family. Look at verse 18. Pray that it may not happen in winter. Thankfully, the Lord answered his own prayer. This took place in the summer of 70 A.D. Look at verse 19. In those days, there will be such a tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation of God uh, that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short those days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened those days. Their, their dramatic overthrow of Jerusalem, the pride of the temple destroyed in just a few months. And thankfully, Thousands of Christians heeded the Lord's warning and escaped. In fact, Christianity, after the fall of the temple, spread all around the Roman world, and strongholds of Christianity began to pop up all over the Mediterranean and ultimately into Europe. And Verse 21, now if you're a follower of Jesus, you're like, man, the temple is destroyed. It's, it's where God would meet his people. What's going to happen next? Will you come back then, Jesus? If someone says, you look, here's the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For people are going to take the opportunity of a, a catastrophe like that, and false Christ, false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. Be on your guard. I told you all these things beforehand. Je Jesus provides for his followers on that day some instruction, some hope. Here's how you're going to get through what is going to be the most heart-wrenching loss you'll ever, or you'll ever experience as a Jewish person. When your identity and your temple is destroyed, but don't lose hope, because God doesn't meet with people in temples anymore. God meets with people in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. His disciples would learn that. But now look at verse 24, because Jesus goes on to something else. The destruction of the temple is a foreshadowing that points to another day when God will set things right. Judgment on those who do not follow him and rescue for those who are his people. Look at verse 24. And I had this underlined. In those days after that tribulation. So, so there'll be a period of time after the destruction of the temple when God's going to do some things on this world. In this case, it's been extending the gospel, the Christian gospel all around the world. But there will be now not just Religious turmoil, not just political turmoil, not just the kinds of military turmoil, economic famine, things like that. There's going to be something happening worldwide, even in the skies above. The sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. The stars will be falling from heaven. The powers of heaven will be shaken. This didn't happen in 70 AD when Vespasian uh, conquered Jerusalem. In fact, uh, he left Jerusalem, went on to become Emperor Titus. He, he, was, he was that... Uh, he was that popular that he became the next Caesar. And, but there'll come a day when Jesus Christ will return for his people. Look at verse 26. They will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he, that is Jesus, will send out angels, his angels, and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. Which means there are believers all around this world that will be rescued by Jesus at his return. That's, it's glorious, and I, I wish we had more time to cover it. We don't. And if you're a, a Bible reader of Revelation 19 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 24 and 25, just lots to read. But let's read on here because then Jesus goes to answer their question what, what are going to be the signs? What, When's this going to happen? From the fig tree, learn its lessons. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know summer is near. I mean, it's that time of year here in Chicago where 
where the willow trees are blushing green and some of the maples are beginning to have the, the, uh, the buds and the blossoms on them. And it's great. It's a great time. You know spring's coming, believe it or not, even with the snow we saw this morning. <laughs> In the same way, look at verse 29. When you see these things taking place, you know that he is near, even at the very gates. Verse 30. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. What's so amazing about that? In the Bible, generation is almost always defined as 40 years. 40 years is when it all took place and the temple was destroyed. Jerusalem sacked. The stones all taken down. In fact, look at what he says in verse 31. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will not pass away. <laughs> so that the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem serves as a dramatic foreshadowing of the final days before the return of Jesus Christ in glory. As surely as Jesus' prophecy about the temple came true within one generation, just as Jesus said it would, so too, uh, so too Jesus promised that he will return to rescue his people will come true. Now, he turns to that promise. Look at verse 32. He's just told the disciples, when you see these things happen, within a generation, it's going to happen. But what about his return? But concerning that day or that hour, yeah, well, when's it going to happen, Lord? No one knows, not the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. The Son himself awaits the Father to say, now's the time. We do know the gospel is going to be proclaimed all around this earth before that happens. So also when you see these, uh, uh, verse um, uh, 33, be on guard, keep awake. There's those two repeated commands. You do not know the time when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts the servants in charge, each to his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Somebody's going to leave, they're going to leave you in charge of their household, or they're going to leave you in charge of their business, and they say, hey, I'll come back. In the meantime, stay busy. <laughs> That's what Jesus was saying. Yeah, I'm coming back one day. You're not going to know when. The Father will decide when that is. In the meantime, stay busy with the work. And verse 35, therefore stay awake. You don't know. He's referring to himself. You don't know when the master of the house will come back. In the evening, in the midnight, when the rooster crows, uh, crows that's early in the morning, 3 or 4 o'clock. Or in the morning, at dawn, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. So that the last word in Jesus' talk to his disciples about the future is, wake up. <laughs> Pay attention. Dramatic things are happening in our world now. Do they point to Christ's return? Maybe, maybe not. We don't know. What we do know is in spite of whatever we face, personally, culturally, or even in our own family, whatever we face, we're called to stay awake, be discerning, and live with hope. So, uh, let me say a thing or two about the second coming of Christ. Again, I wish we had more time to cover, we won't, but just sort of lifting out of this text here. The second coming of Christ will be spectacular, sudden, sure, and surprising. We just don't know when. Uh, it's going to shock us when it happens. It'll be sudden. Uh, I've been on this uh, cast boot here. I don't have a cast, but the boot for uh, two weeks now. And uh, fell and broke my foot on a Friday. On Sunday, after church a couple weeks ago, Vicky and I climbed onto an airplane, went down to Houston to see our daughter, son-in-law, and grandbaby, and spent a few days there. Thursday, we were coming back, landed at O'Hare, and, uh, you know, this is a great way to get through the airport. And so we're, we're, we're going from the terminal back to uh, a pickup and, uh, where we're going to be picked up. And um, you know that place in Terminal 1 where you go underneath the tarmac and there's like the goofy lights overhead and then there's the, the moving walkway, right? Okay. So we're there. Now, Vicki, of course, has the suitcase because I'm, you know, laid up like this. And uh, she made a decision to go in the center of the two moving walkways going our direction. I thought, well, I can keep up with her. And so I went to the one on the right. And she was walking very briskly. And I thought, well, I can keep up with her because, you know, I've got wheels. And I was, except that I saw in front of me um, a, a little white-haired guy. Nothing wrong with white-haired guys. This was a, a smaller man, older guy. And he was kind of walking very slowly, holding on to the, 
the rail. And um, I thought, I can take him. <laughs> and I did what I should have done. I, I went around and I said, uh, on your left, I'm passing. And uh, gently went around him. And, and, but the front left wheel of this little scooter made contact with the side, which was not moving like the walkway was. And in that instant, I got a lesson in physics. Because my, my scooter stopped immediately. Inertia, however, drove me forward. A somersault, where I landed on my shoulder and rolled over. And for the moment that I laid there, I heard two things. One, I heard the gasp. <gasps> Are you okay? From people all around me. It was a fine moment for me. Secondly, I became aware of the moving walkway is ending. And I thought, I'm going to be that guy on the news who died because he was shredded by the moving walkway. And then, to my surprise, I was rescued by the old white-haired man that I was trying to pass. And in that moment, I also realized why he was holding on with his one arm to the side so hard. It was the only arm he had. There I was, laying on my back, listening to the moving walk landing when a one-armed man reached down and rescued me. It was surprising. And it was not my finest moment. Uh, the return of Christ will be surprising. It will, however, be his finest moment. And we just don't know. We don't see it coming. But it is going to be surprising, as my experience was surprising. So, how can I be prepared for the future? As a follower of Jesus Christ, how should I live my life in a way that says I'm prepared for the future and I'm not fearful about that? Let me give you some thoughts, four of them, based on what we read in the text today. Number one, how can I be ready for the future? <laughs> be watchful. Over and over and over again, pay attention. Don't be surprised. Be watchful. Stay awake. Be aware. Remember what I said at the beginning of the message? Christians should be the most discerning and the most hopeful of all the people in the world. Do not get sucked into, this must mean Jesus is coming back now. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. That's up to the will of the Father in heaven, not up to whoever's writing a book about it. Not to whoever's running a podcast or trying to sell you a subscription. Be thoughtful, be discerning, be watchful. Do not be fooled by fakes. Do not be surprised by suffering. Do, do not be discouraged by disaster. We can recognize that, yeah, the world is a dangerous place. And there are times when it feels like it's getting worse and worse, as our rock star said on Friday night. But my response to it is not just, well, you know, live a day at a time. My response to it is to be ever more aware of how God is at work in this world and what he's calling me to do and to be. Be watchful. Secondly, be hopeful. If there was something I wish I could give to you, certainly to younger generations, it would be an infusion of hope. Somehow for me, and it's a discipline I try and put in my life, especially as I read the scriptures and understand them, I've grown more, not less hopeful. And the more we understand about Christ's return and the promise and the glory that will be ours in that moment, the more our hope should shine. Be hopeful. The more uncertain our world becomes, the more precious Jesus' promises become. The darker our days grow, the brighter our hope for Christ's return shines. And the stormy our society rages, the safer our shelter in Christ secures. You and I can be hopeful, not because we've got a better idea or we think we're smarter than someone else, but because we've chosen to trust the one who is directing this culture, directing this world, and will say enough when he returns in glory. Be watchful, be hopeful. Three, be productive. Over and over again, Jesus says to his followers, hey, I want to find you busy when I come back. The hope of Christ's return doesn't make us sit back and strum a guitar and eat bird seed and think, well, one day Jesus will show those people. What it inspires us to do is for us to show those people the hope and the glory of Jesus Christ before it's eternally too late for those people, many of whom we love, work with, or go to school with. Be productive. Whatever you do, however you serve, 
turn that dial up a little bit. As the time grows shorter, the time for us to serve grows more intense. Be watchful, be hopeful, be productive, and then fourth, be holy. Holiness means to live different than the people around you. It means we live with an awareness that one day, no matter how crazy the world may seem, or our personal, the attacks on us personally may be, one day Jesus Christ is returning, and so therefore I live different than other people. Because I have that assurance of Christ's protection, of his return, of his saving power and grace. I don't have to live like the people around me. I have different values. I have a longer perspective. I recognize there's an eternity to gain. And that motivates me to live a holy a life that is deeply aware of Christ's presence, powerfully different in an attractive way than the world around me. Let me do this. Let me pray over you. I've asked the worship team to come and lead us again in the song, Cornerstone. But I want to pray over you as we move into this song. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Lord, Trust him today. Be prepared for the future, that coming day of salvation and judgment. And for those of us who do, can we be renewed in our hope and our discernment? Father, I pray for your grace to be in evidence. The Spirit of God, as Jesus promised, to teach us what to say. And Father, I pray you would use my words today to stir faith in the hearts of some who need to know Jesus as Savior, as Lord, the returning King who died and rose again for us. Father, I pray that we who know him, who follow him, who love him, would live with hope, clear-eyed in our discernment. Lord, recognizing you are not done. You will not let this world spin out of control. Lord, because of that, we hope, we rededicate ourselves to loving, serving you, and shining the gospel light to this community around us. Make it so, Lord, we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' strong name. And all God's people agreed by saying,